Please be seated. Good evening to you. Let's turn to John's Gospel, chapter 1, Sunday night through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. We remember that the purpose of John's Gospel is in order to uh, bring people to a faith in Jesus Christ for salvation and the forgiveness uh, of sins. And uh, John does that by means of this beautiful description of Jesus uh, in the first 14 verses of chapter 1 that describe Jesus in a way that is just peerless. He is unique in all of human history. Uh, No one compares uh, to him as just an evidence of of how worthy he is of of our faith. And again, how well placed our our faith is. Uh, If you and, and I believe in the Lord, and I believe in the Bible. But if I read the Bible as a pagan with any kind of appreciation, and of course you can't because it takes the Holy Spirit to open it up, but I would have to give God credit that if the whole thing were a fable, that um, you got to give Him credit uh, for uh, hitting what our needs are identifying what our needs are and providing them so masterfully in Jesus. Now, he's not taking pot shots at this. He created us. He knows what those needs are. But, um, you know, what a description we have here in these, uh, these uh, verses that we're looking at related to, uh, to Jesus, the description of him and how he's uniquely qualified to be man's Savior. And then he builds the rest of the book, John does, building the case for Jesus as a Messiah and as Savior based upon seven I Am statements and seven miracles that we will uh, get to. And tonight we continue this theological description of Jesus in chapters 1 through 4. We pick it up in verse 3, but uh, remembering last time that uh, he's described as the Word, the Logos. He reveals to us exactly what God the Father is like. Creation teaches us, it's general revelation, it teaches us that God is powerful and it teaches us that God is wise. When you look at the creation from the microscope or the telescope and everything in between, that's what creation tells us. But it doesn't tell us what he is uh, like uh, beyond that. And Jesus is the one who teaches us that. We learned also that he is, uh, Jesus is eternal and self-existent and that he is divine. He not only uh, was with God, but he is God. And now we come uh, to verse 3. And all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And in him was the life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And there was a man sent from God whose name was John, speaking of John the Baptist. And this man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness to that light. And that that was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, speaking of Jesus, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. And he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received uh, him, to them he gave the right or the authority to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh, Jesus, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and uh, truth. And so in verse 3, we're told that Jesus is further, He is the Creator of all things. And so this uh, truth is so important to John in verse 3 that he says it twice. Uh, He declares it both positively uh, and negatively. And so he has created all things. If something is made, then Jesus made it. He is the origin of all creation. He is the person 
of the Godhead uh, that brought all of creation into existence and without exception, everything owes its uh, existence to him. Whether it's uh, visible, whether it's the material world uh, that we can see all around us, again, what we can see with the telescope, the naked eye, with the microscope, uh, he created all of those things, or whether things invisible to our naked eye, things that are uh, that we can't see with the naked eye, the spiritual uh, realm constituting uh, angels around us, and even the demonic realm that is around us, the thrones, the powers, uh, the dominions, the entire angelic realm, uh, he created uh, all of that. Colossians chapter, three, uh, chapter 1 verse 16, for by him, speaking of Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him uh, and for uh, him. Hebrews chapter 1, God who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last times spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made uh, the worlds. And so as John is arguing here in the gospel of John for faith in Jesus Christ here, he's making the point, don't ever stop in your search for God uh, by worshiping the creation. And of course, in the ancient world, there was a lot of the worship of creation, a lot of worship of creation uh, even today. And uh, when we're looking at Revelation in the morning, uh, the book of Revelation, and you see the devastation that the various uh, uh, judgments that God brings upon uh, uh, the earth, and there's a reason for all of those judgments, even as there was a reason for each of the plagues that God brought upon Egypt in order to deliver uh, Israel out. But one of the things that he's communicating is at that time, the world is being created. If there was even one one percent of the concern uh, for God as creator in this world, certainly in the Western world, as there is for global warming or for Mother Earth, uh, the whole world would be saved. And, uh, and so uh, God comes in and, and, uh, and, and this, this worship of the world and, the, and how illogical it is because the creator is always greater than the creation by virtue of his ability to create the creation. And so here is this push that he, he's giving uh, here to uh, worship Jesus as the creator. If he's created all things, again, he can't himself be uh, created. And we look at that as Christians and depends on what your uh, Christian experience and your path is for uh, becoming a Christian. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of people in the world that uh, need to realize that Jesus is not created. The Jehovah Witnesses and others, Jehovah Witnesses, as I mentioned last week, they teach that he is an angel, that he is uh, Michael the archangel, and John just blows all of that stuff up in the first chapter of, uh, of this gospel. And so it speaks of of Jesus' infinite power, his ability to speak all of creation uh, into existence. That's pretty powerful. I don't know what you've ever spoken into existence. But send me an email. Uh, but that, that's something. I can, we can fiddle around with popsicle sticks and some glue and, and make something, but somebody's got to make the popsicle sticks first and the glue. But I mean to speak not a popsicle stick into existence, that would be a wow factor. That would separate whoever could do that from every one of us. But he spoke everything that exists into creation. And that's our Savior. And that's our God. And, and uh, additionally, as he's uh, arguing for a faith in Jesus as Messiah, John is making the point that every single human being belongs to God fundamentally, even if they're not a Christian, they belong to him by virtue of creation. And so um, nobody can uh, look at Jesus and just blow him off. 
I, I owe nothing to him, I, and, and I don't want anything to do with him. I don't owe him my worship because I'm not a Christian. And, uh, but the fact of the matter is, as John declares here, is that we owe him our worship and our submission, if for no other reason than we've been created by him. And, and uh, Psalm 100, verse 3, know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us, and we are his by virtue of being his creation. Psalm 95, verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And so everyone uh, is God, it, 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 it belongs to God by virtue of creation. There's a famous story that's told, it's just a sermon illustration, and we all read the same book. <laughs> if you've heard it, uh, bear with me. But there is the story about this man, uh, a boy who made this uh, sailboat, a model sailboat. He goes out to the lake that's near his house, and uh, he puts it into the water, and wondering whether it's going to sink, is it going to sail, what's it going to do? Oh, it was a fabulous sailboat. And uh, the wind came up, and it blew further than he could reach it from the shore, and it was lost. So he lost it. He goes home. His mom asks him, how did the sailboat uh, uh, sail? He goes, better than I thought it was. I lost it, and it sailed across the lake. So he's going through town, and he passes a second-hand store, and he sees a sailboat in the window. And he goes inside to the proprietor, and he says to him, uh, listen, that sailboat belongs to me. I made it. Shows him the nicks and everything, the details in, in making it. And the man said, listen, uh, it belongs to me. He said, I, I bought it, and if you want this sailboat, you're going to have to buy it from me. And so he goes home, he gets his nickels and his pennies, and he puts them all together. He goes back to the thrift store, and he buys then uh, the sailboat. And he's walking away from the store. He said, you're my boat. You're twice my boat. First, you're my boat because I made you. And second, you're my boat uh, because I bought you. And every single person in this world belongs to God by virtue of creation, but the Christian is unique in that uh, we are twice gods by virtue of creation and redemption. In verses 4 and 5, we're told further that in him, in Jesus, was life. And so this verse, it opens with a Greek preposition, en, which means in, as it's in, in your Bible there. And the idea here is that he is the source of a spiritual life that cannot be found anywhere else but in him. He's the only one that can give it in the world because he is the only one who possesses it. He is the lone source uh, of this life, of everlasting life and also of abundant life. I remember, and some of you might remember as well, when I was a new Christian, there was a guy that was on the radio and his name was Dr. Walter Martin. And Dr. Martin had, I don't know what kind of a brain he had, but he had a brain. And uh, I would assume he had a photographic memory, an unbelievable recall of what, what he learned. And so he was an apologist for Christianity. They would, people would call in, Mormons would call in, Jehovah Witnesses would call in, um, uh, New Age people would call in and pose these questions uh, to him. And he not only knew the Bible inside and out, but he knew the Book of Mormon inside and out. He knew the Book of Mormon like I would like to know the Bible. And, and the New World Translation, and then, you know, what all of the different religions of the world believed. And he could quote just massive sections uh, of, of their, their scriptures. But he was called by God to do, uh, do that. Most of us, we do very well, uh, and it's all legitimate, to wake up in the morning, live our day honoring God, growing in our study of the Word of God and our knowledge of God. We don't have time to read the Pearl of Great Price with the Mormons or Doctrine and Covenants or the Book of Mormon uh, in order to get briefed up on that. And if you do that, do you know how many non-Christian cults are in the United States? 
Do you know how many religions are in the whole world? I mean, we, we would spend our whole time uh, trying to get uh, briefed uh, on all of these things. And what John is telling us here and, and, and it, it, it is that when we as a Christian speak to anyone else who is not a Christian, we are offering them something that they will never find in what they are involved in. We can know that whatever they're engaged in, however generationally they're invested in it, however personally invested uh, that they are uh, in that, that they are not experiencing the life that we are experiencing. They still have a need in their life for what it is that, that we offer. And we can be intimidated related to that and think, well, boy, my, it's, I mean, this guy's given his entire life to uh, being a Sikh or to being a Buddhist or whatever, whatever it might be. And, and uh, he seems to be completely satisfied with, with where he is. And what in the world am I going to offer him? And our responsibility is to simply tell the person about God's love, about uh, the separation that sin has produced in our life from this God that loves us, but that God has provided a Savior and a means of forgiveness and relationship with Him through His Son. And then to walk away from that and to realize that nothing they have compares to that. No life that they are living compares to the life of the simplest Christian in the world because Jesus alone is the source of this life. And it gives us an important understanding uh, related uh, to him as we would share even with atheists or the people that are into paganism or the worship of themselves or whatever that might, might be. The search for uh, e spiritual truth, the search for eternal and abundant life, it ends when we come to him. And then we're satisfied. Remember Jesus spoke to the woman at the well and he said to her, whoever drinks of this water, physical water, you'll thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And so John was letting uh, seekers know then and now that life is found in him and a, a, a truth now as Christians that we've come to know experientially. So when we become a Christian, uh, the search is over. We know we're home. The Holy Spirit bears witness to that. Now, we, when we first become a Christian, we probably, unless you're raised in church and you got all this information in your noggin, and then you're born again later, I mean, you, you can fast track a little bit. But, but when, when we become a Christian, there may not be a lot we know. So we're, we're not satisfied with what we know and what we don't know. We will always want to be learning and growing. But the idea that now there is something else out there uh, that is superior to that, uh, all of that uh, goes by the wayside. We know that the search is over. He says in verse 5 that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not uh, comprehend it. And so the world is a dark place because of the fall. It's fallen. Uh, human hearts are a dark place because of the fall. Our hearts are, are, are dark. And uh, so when he talks about not comp comprehending uh, the darkness, not comprehending the light, the comprehend it means to grasp or lay hold of or overcome. And this could mean that, uh, that, that they did not understand Jesus. They didn't understand him. They didn't understand why he came. If you have a different translation, it can equally mean that the darkness did not, uh, could not overcome or conquer uh, his light. But, but either way, it communicates the same thing, that Jesus is the way out of darkness. He is the way out of demonic darkness. He is the way out of the darkness of sin, the darkness uh, of self, emotional darkness, spiritual darkness, physical darkness. He is the way out of that. And so anyone that remains in that darkness is, remains there 
um, not because there is not a deliverance from that, but, but because they love darkness and they choose to remain in that state uh, if, they've, if they've heard uh, the gospel. And I think about how wonderful it is to be, and I, don't, I assume that your family and your friends are like my family and my friends, and, and people are complicated. And life is complicated. And you know why people are complicated and life is complicated? Because sin is complicated. And, and as long as a person stays away from the Lord, the solution to get on the path that we're supposed to be on, the path that we've been uh, created for, there's just going to be problems. And then problems compound themselves. And then, and then you look at a, a person's life and you can almost say, there's no hope for them. I mean, they have tapped into such unbelievable darkness in their life. There is no way for them, uh, humanly speaking, out of that. And then humanly speaking, there isn't. But to be able to say to anyone we run into, no matter how much of a brain they have left, because of what they've done with their brain on drugs or whatever occult things they, that, that they have uh, been in, and to be able to come up to them and, and to tell them that Jesus is the answer to, uh, th- this is not something that you've th- been 30 years building, and now it's going to take you 30 years to get out of. Give your life to the Lord, and, and He will bring His light into your life, and He will change you. And he does that. And so nobody's outside of the the hopeless category and and Jesus is able to deliver uh, mankind out of any and all uh, darkness. It's been interesting to be a pastor for a few years. And um, so I I don't always get to know uh, everybody that attends the church uh, well. I wish I could. We'll do it in the millennium. But, um, But... Sometimes when I, somebody will come in and they'll see me or they'll talk with me after a service or whatever and they'll start to tell me my story, their story. You go, wow, if the people sitting around you only knew, that entire section would be vacant uh, in the sanctuary. And, uh, and, and yet God has delivered us. He's delivered. We all have been delivered out of darkness. It just depends uh, what the darkness is. We're all tapped into enough darkness to destroy ourselves uh, in this life and then for the life to come. And Jesus takes us out of that. He is greater than every need in that regard. He goes in, in verses 6 through 8. Uh, John the Baptist is brought into, uh, into the passage and, and he's introduced as for what he was and that was a witness to Jesus uh, as the light. And so John uh, tells, uh, declares that he was, he's not the light, he is not the Messiah, he was sent to bear witness to uh, that light. And so John the Baptist never drew people to himself. There's always point, before he baptized Jesus and, and knew that he was the Messiah in that way of that revelation. He was always pointing people to the Messiah who would come. After he recognized Jesus as Messiah, he's always pointing people to Jesus uh, afterwards and, uh, uh, and uh, speaking to him as, uh, as the Messiah, pointing them uh, to Jesus. In verse 9, Jesus is described as the true light. And the word true, it means genuine. There's a lot of false lights out there spiritually. And there's a lot of people saying, this is the way, this is the way. And, and false religions and teachers and messiahs all uh, through the age. But Jesus is the true life, light because he is testified to uniquely so uh, by the Old Testament uh, scriptures. And unlike, uh, unlike all of these other uh, people that declare themselves to be light or to give revelation or illumination or these kind of things, Jesus will uh, never disappoint. He gives life to every man who comes into the world. So he not, is not only uh, uh, true light, but he brings that light into our lives through salvation. He, you know, he could have saved us and just said, you know, I'm the true light and uh, I'm going to save you but I'm not getting inside of you. And who could blame him? If you knew my heart, you wouldn't want in. And if I knew your heart, 
I really wouldn't want to get in. So you're not better than me. But, but here is this, this light where he says, I, I, I am going to not only be the light, to be the, the example uh, and uh, the manifestation of God in human history, but I will bring my light into your life. And then I will make you a city set upon the hill and, and the light of, of the world. And so he does. Now, now that's a truth we just get used to. I'm the light of the world. I've heard that. It was the second sermon I heard when I was a new Christian, we might uh, think and say. And, and it's, a, it, it's an old and a well, well-known truth to us. But the key is to never lose the awe over it. Do you remember what came out of your life before you became a Christian? In, in, in what kind of a light you were for only God knows what. No light is a black hole, there's darkness. And yet he has come into our lives and he has made, brought his nature into us. And, uh, and only as the true light uh, could, could he do that, make us uh, holy even as he is holy. And verses 10 through 13, he was received, uh, we're told, uh, by some. Jesus was. He was rejected by uh, others. And so John begins with those who uh, rejected him in verses 10 and 11. And uh, the idea is he's talking about, when, when, by the time you get down uh, to verse 10, and he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him, your jaw is supposed to drop. <laughs> I mean, it, it, that the world would not know this God, uh, that the world would not come to this God for salvation, somehow feel that I'm too good for that, or it do, he's, he's not qualified to meet my needs, or whatever it might be. The, the idea is just an astonishment that anyone would, would re- reject him at all, as Jesus is described thus far uh, here. And that's certainly how the rejection of Jesus is uh, viewed from the vantage point uh, of heaven. And of course, as the, as the uh, uh, observation and the good observation is made related to what a, a person does with Jesus is that what we do with Jesus, if, if a person rejects him, it's never a bad reflection upon Jesus. It always reflects poorly uh, 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 upon us. There's a man that was looking at some pictures in a famous art gallery and he said out loud, I don't think much of these pictures. And the, the attendant in the room said, excuse me, sir, uh, the pictures are not on trial. And uh, that's how it is uh, related to, uh, to Jesus. I remember I walked into a, an art gallery in Carmel. And at that particular point in my life, I mean, art was... Uh, Dutch paintings and these landscapes and seascapes and all of this kind of thing. I didn't have an appreciation for these like bright flowers all over the place and uh, everything on a canvas. It was a little bit, um, I didn't appreciate it the way that I appreciated other things, uh, uh, these other kind of the the masters. And uh, so I walked in and there was this big giant canvas and it was just an absolute explosion of color. And uh, I didn't even uh, know where the attendant was in the gallery. And I said, who would buy that? And then I heard her say, lots of people. And of course, now at the age that I'm at now, I'd rather have the explosion of color uh, in, in the house than, than something else. But it, it, it's always putting us on, on, on trial or it, 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 it's uh, exposing uh, our, our ignorances. And so he speaks of in verse 10, the rejection of the Gentile world, the rejection of Jesus against the witness uh, of creation. Again, creation speaks of a creator. Uh, everyone, nobody is going to be innocent of rejecting Jesus Christ one day solely on the basis of creation. Because creation speaks of the existence of God because of the complexity of life and and, and fearfully and wonderfully made. And so that is intended to put someone on the search to then know who this God is. 
And the Holy Spirit will always then be faithful to take that person uh, to Jesus Christ, take that person to the Scriptures to find out about Jesus on a level that nature doesn't communicate uh, related uh, to him. But all of us are uh, this, this whole world that we live in, all the blessings that we enjoy from this physical world. Uh, that, and, and so often a person can live their whole life and hardly give a thought to it uh, at all. And yet it's condemned here. Uh, the rejection of Jesus as the creator uh, against the witness of creation. Then in verse 11, there's the, he, he addresses the rejection of the Jews. And the rejection of the Jews, despite the witness of the Old Testament scriptures to Jesus as the Messiah, the prophetic witness to him uh, as, as the Messiah. So the Jews in their rejection of Jesus, they were far more responsible uh, for their rejection of him than any Gentile was because they had been given greater light by virtue of having uh, the scriptures and having that kind of a, a, a legacy and heritage in their lives. But it didn't stop there. He goes on in verses 12 and 13 to speak about uh, the many who did and do uh, believe in him. And I love verse 12, to those who believe in him and received him, uh, were born again, verse 13, and he gives us the authority to become the children of God. This is the right, but it's really the authority. So nobody should ever, who is a Christian, have somebody come up to us and say, are you a Christian? And um, out of either false humility or out of an ignorance of the Scriptures and say, I hope I am. No, once we've trusted in Christ for salvation, God says, you have the authority to call yourself a child of God. You've done the single greatest thing that any human being can do in order to honor me in trusting in my son. I give you the authority uh, to declare yourself uh, to be uh, the children of uh, of God. And so that confident declaration that, that we are able to make as a result. And we've be, we, we now have a relationship where we become the children of God. It doesn't just mean that we're saved, but we are now in a parent-child relationship with God. But he's a great parent. And uh, the rest of us fall way short of that and, and uh, uh, brought into his uh, into his uh, family. And then verse 14, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, and the word became flesh and dwelt uh, among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he became flesh, Jesus did, his incarnation, and, and he became flesh in order to die on the cross one day for us, but also to dwell among us, to enter into human history, as a human being, fully God, fully man, and, uh, and, and in order that, that he might, we might see him and what deity looks like uh, up close. And so he's, he became flesh. Uh, he had always existed as God, uh, the Son of God with uh, the Father in heaven. But then he chose to come into the world in a human body and he dwelt among us, we're told. It literally means he tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent. Uh, these bodies are tents, and uh, they're temporary uh, kind of beings, uh, body, uh, 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 vessels, uh, uh, so to speak. And so he dwelt among us uh, 33 and a half years in this world. And we're told why he did that in verse 14, that we might behold his glory, the glory as the, of the only begotten of the Father, who is full of grace and truth. And he did it in order that we might have the privilege of seeing him, uh, of, of observing uh, him for a very long time in the context of this world, to witness his glory uh, up, up close. We, so we uh, know from the scriptures of his glory in heaven. We see the praise that is offered to him. Uh, Jesus prayed on the night before his crucifixion that he would be able to return to the glory that he left in order to come into the world. We understand what his glory looks like in the context of heaven. 
But what does His glory look like in the nitty-gritty of this fallen world? We know how God conducts Himself in the holy confines of heaven. But if we wonder how in the world would he conduct himself if he was in the middle of a mess that we find ourselves in every single day, in the nitty-gritty of life, and Jesus coming into the world it, uh, gives us that revelation and that example. And as we watch what, how he conducted himself in every situation that he was in in the world, everything that he said, and then more as importantly for some of us, everything that he didn't say, that we would have said and shouldn't have said in that situation, now we get to see what that the glory of God looks like in the middle of this fallenness. And He's the one uh, that allows us to see all of that beauty and that glory of God and exe- exactly how it would express itself in our context. The Greek word for uh, beheld that John uses here uh, of beholding uh, Jesus' glory is a word that we get our English word theater uh, from And so to watch Jesus' life and ministry unfold uh, moment by moment was like watching this uh, giant epic presentation at a theater uh, of, of the glory of God, what God is like, only this was real. I remember when I was, I forget what age I was, I remember being uh, young, but I remember when Lawrence of Arabia came out. That's when they made movies with intermissions. And uh, I'm thinking about whether I'm going to say what came into my mind at this moment. No. I'm not going to do it. That was an epic, though. And I love that movie. It's my favorite movie to this, to this day because it's faithful to... Uh, the writings of, of T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, faithful to the, the book, The Seven Pillars of, of Wisdom that he wrote related to his experiences. But it says so much, it, it's so educational. But to sit in there and then just see this epic, I mean, all of that sand and all of that, everything right in front of you. And then here is Jesus. I mean, the, the, in his incarnation, the, the, he's, we're in a theater watching something uh, happen in the world that had never happened before, would never, will never happen uh, again in the same way, and and we are watching a, an epic life, a life that deserves our attention being glued upon every revelation that's given to us in the Gospels of of his life and his ministry and and of his his teaching, and so. What did we discover, John, tell us here as a result of his, Jesus' incarnation? We discovered that he is full of grace and uh, truth. And Jesus always treated people with grace, always treated them with grace. I mean, even when he cleared the temple, even when he called the religious leaders a brood of, of vipers, it was still grace. They deserved worse. They deserved worse. And they needed to hear the truth about their condition and what they were, what they were doing and how it was viewed uh, by God. But here, treating people with grace, and yet all the way through as he deals with, and, and this, is the, this is the thing related to him as you look and you say, okay, I'm in the theater, I'm watching his life, so to speak, by the Holy Spirit, through the Scriptures, and you see him deal so graciously with people, but he never violates truth. He is also absolutely true in how he lived and what he spoke. And that's the funny kind of combination related to our lives, isn't it? That's the perfect combination, being full of grace and full of truth. I think, I, I, I think that um, with the, the average person, you know, you've got this scale of one to a hundred and... Uh, probably mankind is represented equally all the way across in terms of personality in, in, to some degree. But, but I think there are people that are very much loaded uh, toward the truth side of things. 
That's where they, they begin in looking at, at anything in life. The truth is the most important thing, and, uh, and if anyone violates that truth, uh, I'm going to take their heads off. And so there's no, there's no grace. It's all truth and no grace. And then you got at the other end of the extreme, you got people who are all grace. I mean, they'll forgive and forgive and forgive, and they'll overlook and, and they'll overlook any and every sin without ever confronting it, and it's all grace and there's no truth. They will never speak truth to that human being about their situation or how God sees it. And, and so both groups have to learn, and God is faithful to do it in our lives, to to keep us growing into that, that middle ground where it isn't just truth, but now it's grace. And it isn't just grace, but now it's truth. And we're never like Jesus until both of those things are represented within, within our lives. And it's just this beautiful uh, combination, this beautiful balance of grace and truth that we see in the life of Jesus and that John says we ought to take particular uh, note of. I remember when the church was new, we were down on 10th and F, and um, the, uh, we were doing some kind of a thing, whether it was the bulletin in the early years or whatever it was, and, and I was just praying to the Lord, and I said, Lord, what, um, uh, what, what verse do you want to have kind of be the verse related to Calvary Chapel of Modesto? And I'm praying, and I'm asking him and all of these things, and, and, uh, and then one day, he, he directs me uh, to John chapter 1, verse 14. We beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten uh, uh, Son of the Father, and so forth, and full of grace and truth. And that perfect combination that, that we aim at, I, I rarely hit it, but I aim at it, of uh, uh, this being a place, uh, there is grace and there is also truth. And uh, one not to the neglect uh, of the other. Some of you remember down on 10th and F when we had that big blue banner and I had the descending dove on it and then it said, Jesus Christ, full of grace and truth in white against this dark blue. And, uh, and then everybody, I found out later, everybody told me after we moved here, yeah, when you would close the service up in prayer and we close our eyes, all we could see was Jesus Christ full of grace and truth because it was so etched in their eyes from, uh, from looking at it. But, but we, what we wanted them to know about anybody that came, if, they, if, they, if, if nothing about the sermon or the teaching impacted them in any way, made a dent at all, or the worship or anything at all, that they would at least leave knowing that he's full of grace and truth. And it came out of, uh, of this uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, verse, uh, verse 14. And so John uh, then asks in these, basically in these first 14 verses, he asks the whole world, uh, what are you going to do with this? That's who was born into the world. That's who Jesus Christ is. What are you going to do with him? Now, you have to do something with it. Everyone will do something with it. Some will believe it, some will reject it, some will ignore it, but everybody will do something with this description of the Holy Spirit, of, of Jesus, and John writes it in such a way as to communicate the only sane person will make this person their Savior and their God. And that's the case that he lays there in these first 14 verses. And if you sit here this evening and you are not yet a Christian, you don't know that you're born again. You don't know if you were to die, you would enter into heaven. Or maybe this is the first time you've ever heard anything about Jesus in your entire uh, life. All of this is written in order that we would be saved. You say, well, man, I... I uh, I remember way back, and I, I went to that, that uh, church that looks like a prison out there on Pellendale, and uh, the landscaping has really helped. And, and uh, I, I was there, and the, and, and, and the, and the pastor did two weeks, two Sunday nights. He just got through 14 verses there talking uh, about Jesus. And so I, I left knowing more about Jesus than I'd ever known in my whole life. It's not good enough. It's intended to translate 
into the most important decision a person will make in their life. And that is to the decision of what I will do with Christ. And John says, I just want you to make an informed decision. Because if you make a, an informed decision, you will trust in him as your Savior and as your Lord. After the service tonight, if you'd like to pray uh, to become a Christian and a follower of this Jesus, we'll be up in front after the service and we'd love uh, to pray with you this evening uh, for that. But we'll stop there this evening and we'll pick it up in verse 15 uh, next time. And so if the worship team would come forward, we'll just spend a little time as we close uh, our evening worshiping him and contemplating him and letting him put any kind of finishing touches that he wants to put upon our lives this evening.